allow me to call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the uh, Zoning and Design Review Board on May 14, 2013, 6 p.m. Um, we'll note that Chair Durham is absent tonight and therefore I'm standing in for him. Uh, ask for your patience as this is my first uh, chairing of this, this forum and meeting. Um, for those individuals joining us for the first time in the council chambers, the ZDRB agenda and staff reports are available in the in the back and some plastic bins next to the door. For uh, viewers at home, the agenda and staff report are available online at the uh, town's website of www.townofyountville.com. Uh, the ZDRB meetings are broadcasted live on channel 28 through the town's partnership with the Napa Valley TV and, and live web streaming on the town's website. The, uh, while the, while the council's in the chamber, we would ask that you all please silence your pagers, if anyone has any of those anymore, and or cell phones. Um, and while addressing the ZDRB, please state your name and, uh, yeah, for the record, excuse me, and uh, please remember to speak into the microphone. With that being said, Sandra, would you please call roll? If that's how we Member Scoggin. Be present. Here. Member Gates. Here. Let the record reflect that uh, Chair Durham is excused. Next, I would like to uh, ask for an adoption of the agenda. So moved. Excellent. And uh, there are no minutes as of this time. So, uh, let's see. And if there are any public comments not on the agenda or concerning uh, items not on the agenda, please uh, please feel free. We have a five-minute limitation per speaker. Move on from there. Uh, it looks like consent agenda items are vacant as well as public hearing items. We should um, revise the agenda, I just noticed. Okay. Both of the items are public hearings rather than presentation and discussion. Okay. So modify them as 7.1 for the With that being said, uh, move into presentation and discussion. All right. So the first public hearing is for uh, the Winkle Women Residence at 6702 Washington Street. And this is design review to raise the existing structure and to build a new structure in its place. The property is currently developed with a single family residence <coughs> that was constructed in the 1880s, and here is the footprint of that house and the site shown here. Um, over the years, that house was has been added on to. It has, in addition to um, the rear facing east, as well as one-story garage with a flat roof. Uh, the original wood windows and doors have been removed and replaced with aluminum and vinyl sliders. And the original wood um, siding has been stuccoed over. Um, at the northwest um, corner of the property, offsite and in the right of way, is a 20 inch diameter breastite height oak that is listed in the town's um, heritage tree survey. And there's also a 10 inch um, diameter breastite tree located near the south property line. The house itself is not listed in the town's historic resource inventory. The proposal is to build a approximately 937 square foot two-story house um, with most of the living area on the ground floor and with an attached 340 square foot garage. The style of the house is cottage type style with um, exterior siding with window trim and double hung um, multi-pane windows and with a roof, roof pitch of about 6 and 12 for main roof sections and um, that will be composition, composition shingle as well as some portions that are standing seam. 
the residence is set back <coughs> the, at least the minimum requirements of the code, which is 15 for the front setback, 15 for the rear setback, 5 on the north side, and 10 for the south side facing Starkey. It's also consistent with the height requirements of a maximum of 20 for the one st for one story and 28 feet for the two story. The elevations are shown here. Um, exterior, other exterior details include the stone um, uh, veneer, and that's used as a wainscot on the residence, on the chimney, and also for the uh, five foot six inch wall that surrounds the landscape courtyard on the south side of the structure. Um, and uh, the design of the one story garage is carriage style doors with, um, with multi panes above. And that's accessed by a single car driveway from Starkey. And because of the location of the driveway, there is one tree removed for removal, and that's the 10 inch DDA tree I noted earlier. Um, since the site is being re um, developed, there is a proposed landscape plan for six inch tall fencing on the side and rear property lines, except where it um, is located in the front yard, and a new landscape plan that includes a variety of um, plants, including grasses and lavender and boxwood as well as two lawn areas, one in the rear yard and a small section um, in the front yard toward the street. Um, since I mentioned the house is um, an older house in Old Town, built it in the 1880s, staff asked the applicant to have a qualified historian review the project to determine if it held historic significance and what impact the proposal to raise it and redevelop the site would have. Um, and through that, Brunzel Cultural Resources Consulting submitted the report that's in your packet, and it evaluated the existing structure in terms um, of whether it's eligible for the National Register of Historic Places or the California Register of Historical Resources. And based on the number of alterations that have been made to the building over the years and the fact that it doesn't retain um, its original character-defining elements, the conclusion was that it's not a historical resource. We did, however, ask Napa County Landmarks to conduct peer review of the report, and Landmarks noted that the chain of title from 1880 to 1954 is missing, and they thought this was important in order to determine that there was not a person of local significance that lived in the house. And this was raised with the um, historian that conducted the report and it was explained um, of the different elements must be found for a historic resource that the integrity um, is very important and so that's why a limited title search was done. The historian's here tonight if you have any questions regarding that report. So the proposed residence is consistent with the town's design ordinance standards for plate and building height, for setbacks, for floor area ratio, for fence height and location, for exterior finish materials, building orientation, and building elements on the primary facade. In addition to those general requirements are those that are specific to the Old Town Historic District, and those were recently updated. Um, and this is the first project to come before you, um, having applied those standards. And we find that it's very consistent with those standards, um, and and took those standards to heart to develop a building that will fit in with the neighborhood. We note that while stone is used, it's used as an accent feature, and that's in keeping with those standards, um, and that the windows are divided light and multi-paned, and they maintain the one and a half to one height to width ratio that is a new standard of that section. Um, and we find that if, the, if this is an example, that standards are working well to inform I do have um, a material and color board to pass around for you to look at, so you can see the color of the house and the materials used. Um, so we do find that the house is in keeping with the standards, and we are recommending approval. Um, one item that we'd like to touch on um, 
is the Heritage Oak that's located to the northwest corner of the property. And the landscape plan is showing um, numerous hardscape and landscape improvements, including irrigation and even a section of lawn under the tree. We have the town arborist um, review the project and provide recommendations of approval and these are included with conditions in, this, uh, in, in the packet. Um, that all relates to the design review of the building. There's also um, a use permit request to allow tandem parking in the driveway. And the standard uh, for single family residences is that they must provide one covered and one screen parking space. And those spaces must be independently accessible unless the site conditions justify tandem parking, which can be approved with a use permit. Um, and in this case, the lot is a 4,300 square foot lot, which is smaller than the standard for Old Town, where 5,000 is the minimum. It's a corner lot that has deeper setback requirements and so a reduced um, building envelope. And yet it is a small house at 937 square feet with the 350 square foot garage taking up one third of the, um, the floor area. Um, and it is a, a long driveway of 30 feet so it can easily accommodate a second parking space in a tandem fashion. Um, and this condition is similar to what existed um, or what exists currently at the existing residence. Um, and we are recommending approval of these as well. Conditions are included in an attachment to the proposed staff report, and those are the conditions that staff is recommending for when you make your um, action on this project. And that concludes my report, but I do know that the architect is present tonight, as is the historian to represent the project. I'm going to that. We would like to invite them up to uh, make comments, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to do a question? We have some questions. Yes. Sam, would you grant the use permit for tandem parking? Do we need to make any formal findings? Yes. Um, there are the use permit findings that are on page six of the staff report. And when you make your recommendation of approval, you would make the design review findings as well as the use permit. Secondly, the tree protection recommendations, those came directly from the town of Arborist. I noticed in particular the recommendation that the zone be 10 diameters as opposed to, say, the third line. So those did come from there. Uh -huh. My third question is this project required performing the fire uh, We are recommending that they underground the utilities uh, from the nearest service drop to residents. So, no, is the answer. Would, uh, would you rephrase the question? Is this, <laughs> Repeat is it, the project I mean? being required to perform any fund um, No. Thank you. Okay. I just have one question. The stone, five foot six stone wall right on the front of the house and right on the property line is within guidelines. That is, since the Starkey side of the residence represents a side yard, it can go to six feet. So they can do that on quarter lots. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I have no questions on it. Now we'd like to invite the public comment. The applicant, excuse me, the applicant to speak if they did. Hi, my name is uh, Mitch Lady from uh, Inspire Eight Studios, and I'm representing the uh, Winkelmans on the project. Um, Sandra covered a great deal on the project. Uh, I'm, we uh, when we first reviewed. Um, the existing house as is and just kind of noted a lot of the existing conditions within it um, just a, a name a few of them there's uh, multiple water infiltration issues actually they've got a uh, 
great portion of the water actually flows through the uh, fireplace area, through the house, and discharges out the sliding glass door. Uh, in, additional, uh, in addition to that, within it, I'm, what kind of directed a lot of our decision, if look, we did evaluate at first if we were going to try to keep the structure and perform a renovation on it. Um, there's just There were multiple structural points that kind of became part of our determination for moving forward with that. Um, the, uh, just some of the sizing of the members, and then too, I think as, a, um, as, as part, I will discuss with you a little bit relative to the architectural representation of the house, that uh, there was just a lot of character missing from what was the original structure. Um, two, within um, the inside of the residence, I think it had previously been used as a daycare um, over the periods of time with the renovations that happened throughout. Um, the structure that was the garage had been converted. There had been a lot of conver internal conversions on the inside that were going to have to be undone because they didn't fall into conformities. And then, too, with going in to do a renovation type project, there, be there became some other issues, some code issues that would obviously have to be addressed, too. So it's, it's kind of been a, a little bit of an ad hoc kind of thing going over a period of time. But, um, Two, the other thing is uh, the, the property as developed right now, I think there's numerous violations with the uh, location of the fencing. Uh, and then two, when we redeveloped uh, the proposed plan with the attached garage, I think the previous garage was about five or eight feet off of the rear setback too. So we tried to address all those issues. Um, that being said, the client, uh, we, we walked through, kind of made the evaluation. They said if it's feasible, if we could possibly move forward and, and create a new design for the project, they'd like to do that. So. We spent the next two days actually walking through the Old Town District, looking at homes and documenting them um, as far as homes that were representative of their likes and homes that are character elements of the house. And then that's how we moved forward from there in developing the design that we did. Um, knowing that the project sits on the corner a lot, we wanted to be sensitive to that as well to make sure that it wasn't a um, big behemoth of the structure as a focal point there. So we tried to do a lot of care with the roof lines and I think your guidelines too. Of, of requiring the structure to step in just to try to, to integrate it more so it doesn't become a prominent element on that on that corner and it stitches more into the uh, urban fabric that exists there. Um, another aspect that we were trying to do as well in the garage structure to downplay that was trying to bring again some more greenscape in that there. There again another attempt to try to downplay uh, the overall size of the structure. Um, one thing with uh, relative to the, uh, the oak Heritage that exists on the property. Um, in redesigning the project, we tried to be sensitive to all of the existing grades. So um, the new design of the house is virtually following the same grade conditions that are on the site, so they aren't going to require a bunch of cut and fill in locations that could have any adverse reaction to the, uh, the drip line or the root structure. Um, the um, I think the only thing that I, I've, I've noticed too is there's uh, we have one series of utilities that are coming in actually through the canopy into the house, but those are only um, phone lines and cable lines, and the main power feed is actually coming in on the Starkey side, which I think as I talked with Sandra, she said if the project becomes approved, then we would address that and how we could sleeve it into the site rather than bringing it overhead as it currently is. But overall, the, the attempts were really just to make kind of a, a very low-profile structure on the design side. Um, and then um, Car is here to discuss more on the historical side of, uh, as I've talked with Sandra, and, and she had indicated that if, if the project was not considered for a CEQA and following those guidelines, then, then we would move forward to develop the design that you have. And, uh, so Kara is here to uh, discuss that on the historical side. Hi, uh, Kara Brunzel, BCR Consulting. Um, just to uh, sort of uh, expand on on what Sandra said about the uh, the comment that was made regarding chain of title, um, I the legal definition of a historic resource under CEQA and the definition that's been laid out by the the National Park Service under the Secretary of Interior Standards requires that um, a structure be, you know, over 45 years old as a starting point, but in addition to being old, a building or structure needs to have uh, significance as well as integrity. And um, as Sandra mentioned, when we did our 
initial field survey, survey and observed the conditions of the house, it was clear that it had suffered from multiple inappropriate additions over the years and, and did not retain integrity, which, you know, basically in layman's terms means that if you looked at the house, a regular person could say that's an old house. You can't do that with this house because almost every single thing about it has been changed from the, um, you know, the roof, the windows, the doors. Um, it's got a concrete porch, which is probably not original, and then the stucco, stucco on the walls. So um, starting from that point, um, we did a very complete report and which, you know, the clients uh, invested a lot in paying for us to still go and do, we did quite a bit of research, we went to uh, the repository over at Sonoma State, and we um, spent time in uh, Yountville Library, and uh, spent about a day at the county recorder's office trying to uncover chain of title, um, but, you know, for, for uh, buildings that were in rural areas, not a lot of easily obtainable information and we, we already knew that the structure didn't have integrity so um, I didn't feel that it was fair to uh, to the client to do you know weeks of work like we would do if it was an intact adobe or something that was truly going to be found significant so um, that's a maybe long-winded response to the uh, to the chain of title situation it's something we we could probably go back and find um, and and uh, you know add all those you know find out that whole chain of ownership but it's not going to alter the conclusions in the report so it, it seems to me to be you know an unfair burden on the applicant and something that we should save for uh, buildings that that have more Before I ask three quick questions, I'll thank and commend you for a really thorough and complete application and a good-looking project. It's, it's a pleasure to have such a complete application in front of us. Do you have any plans to put a cover over the trash enclosure? Uh, currently, no. Is the El Dorado stacked stone from Chapel Hill natural stone or veneer? Uh, that's currently a veneer. I'm sorry. And culture. I meant it's, to say. It's, a, it's a manufactured material. Do you find grassy pavers or grass creed or anything similar objectionable? Those are my questions. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I also want to reiterate, thank you for bringing such a well thought out plan and one that clearly meets the guidelines of the Old Town District. It's a pleasure to work at this project. Um, there on the uh, land, I think it's on the landscape plan at the corner of Washington and Starkey. There's a folk something designated as a focal point. Can you explain that? We uh, that's that would be the primary entrance location to the property, as we saw uh, coming in. As we had talked with, when I was talking with Sandra. She said, I guess down down the road, the right away in the front would be developed. Possibly developed at some point with uh, it, the, that the uh, town would be commandeering that space back and either making uh, a green area out of that or doing something out of that. So we needed to look at where our entrance to the site would be. Uh, so that's what the thought was that that would probably just be uh, more of a landscape cluster or some sort of landscape design. Uh, not necessarily a physical element or anything, but it's just more of a landscape element that would create kind of a focal point of this is the entry point into the site. Beautiful details to your project. Um, one other question, I don't know who it really relates to, um, just about the driveway and the tandem parking. Um, I know from our neighborhood that on such small houses, the cars usually don't end up in the garage. 
up with one car in the driveway and one on the street. Was there any thought or is it possible to put grass pavers to the side of the driveway to have that be a parking space? It's possible to meet the standard because that area is um, wide enough to accommodate mm -hmm. the space. So that's the sure. I, I mean, that's, that's definitely something we could take into consideration. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. We'll move into the uh, deliberation. I guess. The Unless there's any member of the public, public comment yeah. to speak. Thanks for being here, guys. <laughs> Doesn't look like there's any public comment. <laughs> Chair James, would you like to start? Sure, we'd be delighted to. Again, commend you for a thorough and complete application. It'll be an asset to the neighborhood. This, the existing home has no historic connotation. I know the home. I've been in the home. The home is no Jack Kennedy. It should be raised. <laughs> um, I will disagree with staff. The current driveway, in fact, picture number six on sheet A8 clearly shows the second parking spot. So I can't support the use permit findings to grant tandem parking. There's room both on this property as it's designed and the applicant has already confirmed no objection to grassy pavers, so I think there's a place both to park and maintain a play area. I would urge you to follow staff's recommendation to underground the overhead utilities, at least those portions that are on site. There are examples in town where someone has put up a customer-owned pole at the frontage, so not have to trench across the street, and that would enable the town later when it comes and places the utilities underground to not have to dig up someone's yard. And I personally think it would be a shame that such a lovely dwelling would have wires affixed to its roof. And that I'd be delighted to vote for approval. Comments? Okay. Um, I agree with Jason that uh, it's a beautiful project as is. I agree it's very important to adjust the landscape requirements um, to make sure the oak is preserved in the way that, that the town arborists suggest. And I would like to see um, that space next to the driveway behind parking papers or grass papers or you know, through grass paper type structures that there could be off street parking. Otherwise, it's beautiful. Excellent. Yeah, I'm virtually in agreement with everything the other members here have said. Uh, wanted to thank you guys for making this a relatively easy project to to decide on. Um, I think the underground utilities would probably add a lot of value to your project and, and strongly consider uh, recommend you taking that action. Um, so I'm in, in agreement and, and would approve this project. Take a formal vote and, and add the condition. Mr. Chair, would you like me to take a stab at a motion? Yes, I would. Thank you. I will move to approve the project as presented, making not only the design review findings, but the tree removal findings. We do not make the use permit findings. We will accept all of staff's conditions, recommended conditions of approvals delineated on attachment A, and we will add a condition for staff level approval of a grass key, grass creek or grassy paver installation on the east side of the property adjacent to the proposed driveway for an additional off street parking place. Second. All in favor? Aye. Agenda item 8.2, the design review for the Hughes residence, 7 Forrester Lane. This is a proposal for landscape and hardscape improvements, both in the front and the rear yard. And the re 
request for removal of five existing trees, three of which are in the front yard and two of which are in the rear yard. Um, so in more detail, the improvements consist of removing the porch railing, uh, the front porch railing, and installing 26 inch high by 18 inch square stone pedestals and extending the porch landing further to the east and overlaying the surface with a um, flagstone, installing an 18 inch tall stone garden wall in the area around the front porch, and installing a 10 foot tall trellis over the driveway and in line with the leading edge of the front porch. The trees that are proposed for removal are the two red plums in front of the front porch and one maple that's located at the northeast corner of the driveway. And the applicant proposes planting three replacement trees of 24 inch box size. Um, the applicant also proposes bringing the existing gates forward on the property so that they align with the front elevation of the residence. The backyard improvements uh, include removing an existing attached covered uh, deck to create space for two new placement jacks to install an eight foot tall swing seat structure at the south edge of one of the decks and a 10 foot tall fireplace located nine feet six inches from the south elevation of the residence. Also proposed is an outdoor barbecue counter on the back side of the um, fireplace and as I mentioned two trees are proposed for removal in the backyard and these would be replaced with um, two 24 inch I've noted that the drawings reference adding a two-foot lattice extension to the existing fencing, uh, but this is not part of the application before the board tonight. The extension would be approved um, at staff level upon the applicant securing the written consent of the adjoining neighbors to modify um, the fencing. And I would also note that the rear fence is part of a coordinated system for all the houses on that section of Forrester east of Vista, um, where they back up to the Vista Homeowners Association um, and the open space. So they all feature the same type of um, backyard fencing as well as the backyard lattice configuration, which is on the diagonal. Um, so we find that the project generally complies with the minimum applicable standards in the zoning and design ordinance, but we do have two items that we'd like to raise for your consideration tonight. One is regarding the outdoor fireplace, which is shown in a location nine feet six inches from the south elevation of the residence. And the California Fire Code requires that a fireplace extend two feet above any structure within 10 linear feet. So that would apply here. Um, the fireplace is shown at 10 feet, and that's the maximum allowed by the town's design ordinance. So if it were in this location, it would exceed the height limit. And staff is offering a proposal that the applicant um, flip the location of the fireplace and the barbecue in order to maintain the 10 foot separation and maintain um, the fireplace at a 10 foot height limit. Or alternately, to um, use a fireplace unit that is gas fired sealed combustion so that a, a chimney is not required and the fire separation is not an issue. Uh, and we've included that option as one of the proposed conditions of approval. Um, with regards to the tree removal, we find that the four red plums tend to be smaller landscape plants and we do not um, have issue with them removing these and replacing them with, with landscape um, trees that are more in keeping with their design aesthetic. We are concerned, however, with the maple that's located at the um, north east corner of the property because this serves as a street tree and it contributes to um, the, tree, the streetscape in the neighborhood. The applicants indicated that the reason requested for removal is that a gas line runs underneath the tree, um, but we haven't been able to confirm this. And so staff recommends unless this um, documentation can be provided that this one tree be retained. Um, so as I mentioned, we are um, recommending approval and ask that you find the design review findings and tree removi removal findings in the staff report and approve it subject to the proposed conditions of approval and attachment in. And the applicant's representative is here to represent the project as well. Any questions of staff? Well, 
it might be more of a comment than a question, but before we hear from Bill and addressing the fireplace, Sandra, I think it's a bit more nuanced than you've presented. I think the rule is that from the point of discharge, that point of discharge must be two feet higher than any combustible surface within a 10-foot radius. So it's not even just a matter of moving the fireplace, for example, six inches away. Um, um, well, the distance would be greater on the... Because of the depth of the fireplace, it'll achieve a greater than 10-foot separation. Uh, and so you'll have that... Um, Quite all right. I'm just trying to clarify that it's more than, it's not just 10 feet, that it need be 10 feet away. Within 10 feet, it must be two feet taller than a combustible surface. Just being 10 feet away is not enough. Correct. Oh, correct. Um, and you're able to achieve that, though, if you flip the two, the two items. And you're absolutely correct. Okay. That. Right. So that's the only thing I want to do. Why not? I guess I have a question, and maybe they'll be able to, be able to answer about the, the tree and, and some of the, uh, the issues that you were raising with, with okay. respect to the tree. So I don't know if that's you or, yeah, kind of in terms of the more follow-up that you need. Okay. I don't know if they brought that, so I guess it was their, their questions. I'll move into questions to the applicant. Bill. Hi. Nice to um, see you. Nice to see you, sir. Um, point of clarification. I propose that we extend the front concrete deck. That's the drafting uh, version of a typographical error. The front uh, porch already extends to the corner of this property. So there's no proposal to expand it. Um, for clarification, the reason that we were proposing to remove the railing is that um, the width of the um, front porch as it's built to meet the setback requirements. Um, the client says you can't really lean back in the lounge chair without your feet like hitting the railing. And so um, it's just to kind of open it up a little more. And um, we were hoping to uh, get a little more use out of the site. And um, this Project Washington Square I followed since it was built. Um, and uh, I work for my escape contracting company and we installed lot of the backyards and I drew a lot of the designs for them. Um, but I wasn't um, real clear on, on all of the setbacks and easements and things like that. And Santa's been great at explaining all that to me. Um, so that's what drove the design. The purple plums are kind of, they're not, they're not native. Um, they're a short-lived tree. And the, the fruit is, is kind of a nuisance and it's presented a slip hazard for gas parking. I even have a photograph here of uh, taken last week. I ran out of yellow ink, so my, refuse, my printer refused to keep going, even though it didn't need yellow ink. But you can see the, uh, the plums are scattered on the asphalt and the little stone paper in that some of you saw to create. So um, that's the reason for that. As far as the tree, see, and the plums are in the south, and I mean in the backyard, and as you can see, that they're kind of up where they don't really provide much of anything, and they're out of scale. And so what we were proposing in the back was uh, two uh, Bloodgood Japanese maples and a dogwood, a pink Satomi dogwood. Um, and the decks will be not raised. Well, they'll be at grade. There'll be an inch of airspace, and there'll be a two-by-six synthetic lumber. And we wanted, we were just going to have two little backless benches on the plan, and the client wanted swing seat, rubber swing seat. Um, the thing that um, was very um, challenging for me as a designer is that in order to meet the proper um, codes um, and setbacks for easements and things like that, you end up with a, if you don't, if you, you can't have an attached structure, so the client bought a house with a non-conforming patio structure, and we will take that out. But what we're left with after you come six feet away from, I guess, wait, if, you, if it's attached, I said, no, if it's not attached, you have to be six feet away, yet there's a 10-foot setback for the property line, so what you have across their backyard is at the jig jogs with the 
it's a little wider at the garage, there's a four foot band that you get a play with if you want to conform to the code's regulations. So um, it's tough, you know, you didn't really give the homeowners a lot to play with, but I, I like to go by the rules. Um, and so what we came up with is the fireplace on, on the back side of a shared wall. I, I borrowed the idea from Don Giovanni's where you, where you open in the restaurant, there's a fireplace with two wing walls. So I lifted that and used it on many designs. I propose it here. It stops the wind, provides a little intimacy and privacy reflection. On the back side will be a barbecue. Um, please note that they want the fireplace to be gas fueled only. And so there is a problem with cinders. And I find it kind of um, paradoxical that you guys allow the houses to build chimneys that go like 20 feet in the air, yet we can't build an outdoor fireplace because there's a height limit on it. So I don't know if you guys allow people to build what they call wood burning stoves, or we call them in the, in the trades a pizza oven. But I mean, anyway, so let me stay on point here. As far as the, should I move to the tree? question at the uh, northeast corner of the maple. Okay. Um, the problem is is that um, apparently that area between the driveway and the property line fence, all of the utilities used, it's like the construction, if there's a trench there, everybody will use it, and it looks like that's what happened. The problem is apparently is that we don't know for sure if it was in, the gas line was installed too low or the tree, tree roots have lifted it up, but they had a purple plum removed, and um, not knowing any better, and um, whoever uh, worked the stump grinder hit a gas line, and these guys are grinding stumps for a living, they know where the gas lines are supposed to be, so that's their concern about that, um, and we would be happy to re replace, it, replace it with, I think I propose replace it with one of your designated uh, street trees, in this case the Sweet Alt, the Osmanthus, so that's what we're going to replace the uh, two purple plums in front with, and I believe we were going to do a crepe mold on the side, but now we're thinking maybe we should switch it to a sweet olive, because I didn't know any better, and the place where I proposed we put the crepe myrtle, I go, where was that treated where they struck the gas line? She goes, kind of right where I was going to put the other crepe myrtle, so not knowing any better, I'd already drawn the plan. Um, so that's kind of the design in a nutshell. So. And the garden wall was just to provide a little bit of uh, interest in the front yard because there's not a lot of depth. To play with. Um, I have pictures of all the plants that I chose. It's an extensive plant palette. I have about 30 plants. Most landscape architects would use about eight to ten on a project like this. They're all. It's a very water-wise palette. That's what I'm kind of known for. I designed the water-wise demonstration garden across from what used to be Marie Calendar's or Fire Station Number Three in North Napa. I want to. Um, competition to design that and so there's a lot of unusual plants a lot of natives and uh, we'll be, we want to kind of uh, I like creating kind of a town for garden and so that what drives this design. Questions? Questions for the applicant? Bob, or excuse me, Bill, how do you? That's my middle name, Bob. William R. How do you propose to resolve the difficulty with the fireplace? Um, well, we're not going to burn wood. So will it be constructed in such a fashion that it can't be later converted to wood burning? I don't know about that. You know, people are going to be pretty clever. I don't know that it, I don't think it would feature a log lighter. I don't know that much about gas burning fireplaces with um, what I call, quote, fake logs. Just me, so I'm a bird bird kind of guy. So I don't know is the correct answer to that question. But you know how people are pretty clever. If there's a gas line going there, they might be able to, just like um, nobody was supposed to build a patio cover. And I even told my clients who um, bought a house with a non conforming patio cover. But, I mean, I wouldn't have known. You know, it's a fairly tight set of regulations. I just wanted to say that I think you got a tough challenge there on the front. That's a pretty small canvas to work with there, so good luck on that. 
Can you tell me if any of the other neighbors in the area have either outside fireplaces or that type of proposal that you're putting forward here? Do you know if there might be objections from anybody? That I don't know about. We've seen a lot of apparently non conforming front porches and things like that. I'm talking about the back and the fireplace and um, the, the cooking and all that. I don't remember from the days I worked for John Muser if we installed any. I mean, just in your observations of either side of the neighborhood, have you seen any situations like this? No, I've mostly, in driving around, I've been looking at front yards. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Because that was considered to be the hot point of this project. Because hmm. we were going to um, push the front porch towards the street to where the wall is now. I was told we were going to have a It was advised to be a so we did. I might be able to answer both of those questions. Uh, number one, Sandra, isn't it true that this project was approved under a master development plan? So what you may see, Bill, is legally non-conforming. There was a specific plan. The entire project conforms to its own plan. It's only when you wish to do something that's not part of that master development plan that the other standards come into play. Secondly, about a year ago, did we not approve a very similar outdoor fireplace, just in this, if not on the same street, in the same neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. Quite all right on Fox. With the same, and is it also Thank you. not the case that we imposed this a condition that the fireplace being constructed in such a fashion that it could not be converted to wood burning? Did in that we case, use the language that would be UL rated for gas fired sealed combustion? Was a sealed combustion that was important? Yes, yes. It was very near the neighbor's garage. It was on the property line. I understand that about the project. I contacted the O'Brien group to try and get a whole copy of the CCM. Still to be had. The question that I had regarding the tree, one, you brought up the gas issue. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Well, it appears that there's a, a shallow gas line based on the, um, the fact that um, when a tree was removed, in that same corridor between the driveway and the property line fence. It goes from the street back to where the uh, walkway curves around the um, corner of the garage to go back. So there's about, a, it's about 30 feet by five feet. Um, and so they already moved a tree in that area and the guy working, this, a professional stump grinder, hit a gas line. Luckily, um, nobody got injured or died. That wasn't any issue. But there's a shallow, we know there's a shallow gas line. So the client's worried about the tr that tree and the gas lines. So they're asking that we would, we would replace it with a shrub like that. So that was, and there is a secondary kind of consideration as far as view shed of the hills to the east. That you picked a tree that's big and it crowds. I mean, it crowds. These trees are out of scale. They crowd the front yard. The two on on the uh, the rest of the site we decide to keep, even though it creates kind of a jungle. And there's not much aesthetic about October glories except in the month of October. Other than that, it's just a big tree with like a gorilla with you know branches and all of it. So but we, I like things that are to scale. That's what I was in Sunset Magazine for. I'm awarded by Sons for small spaces. So when I get a challenge like this, you know, I'll, I'll turn it into a botanical garden. So you'll see when it's done, you can come by and see how many plants there are in five, six. And then regarding the, the rest of the neighborhood, does this tree, if this tree is removed, will it look like there's a missing tree from the street's perspective or the neighbor, the consistency of, of the Those tree lines? trees are planted um, in the same, with the same distance of separation as commercial street trees where you find them a certain amount of feet on the center. They are more random in this neighborhood, but every so often and every parcel or every other parcel, they have these larger trees that function as street trees, and so I do think it will um, be a loss if it's removed in this location. However, with that said, if there is a gas line, that is a fair reason to remove a tree if it's creating an interference. Um, all I've heard, though, is the allegations of the gas line, so I'm simply suggesting that they provide proof that it's there, so we have enough basis to remove what we would con otherwise consider an important tree for the There. If that tree stays, there are currently, if no trees were to be removed, you go there right now, and about, what is it, 40 feet of frontage, we have five street trees. That's a little bit of overkill. 
uh, standard spacing for street trees is 20 to 30 feet on the center. If they, if, can I ask staff another question? If they replace that tree hypothetically with another tree in a different location, does that, does that make everyone happy? Um, well, the size of the tree is important when you're considering the streetscape, and some of the proposed trees are on a smaller scale. While they do fill a need, it's for a different um, part of the tree canopy. And it's not replacing the life of life. Can I just want to add that? that we're talking, it's an appropriate tree on a bigger lot. If they're like big trees on a small lot, I think it's important to scale appropriate. So is the real reason the gas line or its scale? I'm confused. The, the, the public health, safety, and welfare issue is a gas line. But I, I guess I'm more concerned about the gas line than the tree. I think the location of the gas line should be properly identified. Somebody should, or if somebody's out there, the wood chipper, and they're knocking over the There's gas line, and nobody that. knows what's going on. I mean, come on. Somebody has got to assume responsibility for what's now you want to add an uh, outdoor fireplace? You don't even know where the gas is coming from? The gas I don't get that. Um, the ga our gas would be coming from the meter on the side of the house. We're but talking about the supply line. you have some responsibility for the gas line that's on the property, correct, Mundo? Yeah, no, I, As a landscape architect? I don't know, but I'm just saying you're telling me that some guy with a wood chipper is kicking over the gas lines, and fortunately there wasn't an ignition, but maybe somebody should investigate what the gas lines are all about. Let's assume the gas line was installed. Which is more important property. to me than the tree. Sure. So, the, so it was either planted at an improper depth. Then which who doesn't should sound fix like it? the O'Brien group. Somebody's got to fix it. Or a tree with a, with a well-developed root system somehow and spreading out like First. this has lifted it. Of course. And, okay. And so, like I say, I don't care about and the so, tree. So if it keeps lifting right, these gas fittings will kind of separate over time. And then you got to gas we'll just rip out the tree, rip sure. out the gas line, and find out what's going on down there. So we would propose um, using one of these smaller scale trees, like we proposed for the After Coppola. the gas line is investigated. Sure. Yes. I'm, I'm, and, I'm oh, okay I'm sorry, for record, the client has put in a call to the equivalent of USA Dig, you know, call before you dig. And all these utilities or Comcast is called back, AT&T. We're going to come out there, but nobody. Well, I nobody think we're all pretty to... exposed to PG&E right now, and what's going on in the town. And I'm... maybe they could come out and check this out while they're here. I believe a request has been put in for that, but nobody has shown up. Yeah. They all kind of responded seems, like, "This is important, but don't do anything." To me but to we'll fix be there. The so. Gas line sure. situation before you go adding more gas appliances, such as the fireplace. Well, that's a good point. Except what, what we're talking about technically is between the city supply line and the meter. We're upstream, we're up, we're upstream from the meter on the other side. We're not, I'm not proposing anything that's in that section where that tree is. You're worried about the tree. I'm saying that oh, I mean, I'm the sorry. gas line should be a little more important to you. And if, if it's not it, working oh, and, and, I'm correctly sorry, I'm, or if it's too shallow, too low, I don't mean to sound deep, disrespectful. That's you're not at all. Into. I'm just saying that prioritizing your Objectives here should be paramount to you, and I think well, fixing course. the gas I, line is more important in the situation with the tree. I wouldn't be a good landscape bar check if everything wasn't focused on public health safety. There you go. So let's get PG out there and check it out. Yes, sir. Anything else? Yeah, just I did want to be clear that we're talking about using gas, and therefore it meets the the requirement of the. They, they're not going to need to flip. Anything if they're using gas in terms of barbecue versus in the, in the fireplace? Uh, is that correct? No, if it's um, if it has a gas starter, but it can be changed to wood burning, which means it's accessible and it can be. In that situation, we would need to either move it or change it to a sealed combustion type of appliance. Is there an option to flip it? Is that something you're opposed to? I'm or sorry, I, I think I was already asked that question. I don't know. I'm okay. not an expert on fireplaces. I can find out for you guys within 24 hours. No, I, and I, I think you build, you 
didn't understand his question. The question was, are you opposed to flipping the barbecue in the fireplace location? Presumably, you, you are an expert on oh, which, you mean the two the locations. Well, it would require a significant additional design time that wasn't part of you know, um, it. It seems like six or one half dozen of the other, but no. I mean, it kind of depends on the character. No, they're not opposed. They're great corners. Um, and they want to, you know, we, they want to have some fun in their backyard. And like you said, we've got a lid, a little four-foot window to play with. So, you know, we can rearrange the furniture, sure. So we've created the condition to to have two options, and whatever is deemed most important to the applicant, they can decide which option works for them. And the backyard, given the constraints they have, so we didn't feel necessary to come up with the solution tonight, as long as one of them. I have nothing to add. Public comment. I'm, I apologize. Public comment. We'll uh, start that over. Hi. I'm John Norton, uh, representing Vista Condominium Homeowners Association. Um, and there was some concern that the applicant applied, uh, or there was some commun communication a few months ago uh, about mainly the, the fence that abuts or adjoins our property, some of our homeowners' properties. And I wanna—I didn't hear any discussion tonight. Is the wooden fence that exists? I did hear something about the two-foot lattice work, uh, but there's the fence is not uh, being removed, or the intent is not to remove that fence. Correct. Okay. Um, at least not as part of this application. If the applicant um, decides to replace it, it would be required to be replaced with in-kind fencing to match the design. And if they're seeking to replace the lattice, at least on the rear section, it would also be held to that replacement in-kind um, quality. And they've indicated that they uh, that they do not seek a change in that. Because originally they were talking about putting an extension on the top that was a, for chicken wire, well, not chicken wire, but the popular um, uh, larger gauge wire. And uh, there was some concern from the homeowners at Vista that that wouldn't give the privacy that the current lattice work gives. And I think we would want to be on record uh, or at least be notified again in future if this comes before the uh, committee again that we would like to be notified that that there's an application to change that because the, the homeowners that border that property uh, on the Vista side are content with the way it looks right now. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move in to our, uh, our deliberation. Do you already do that? I have nothing to add. Okay. sure what to do with that. We are, would be looking for a motion. A motion, not for you. Yeah. So we'll make a motion then. I will move to approve the project as presented incorporating staff's conditions of approval and pertinent part including the two options for the outdoor fireplace as well as the requirement that the ostensible reason for the crate myrtle removal of a hazardous life safety condition be documented to staff satisfaction.
So we've added an item, um, hopefully for your discussion tonight, and to see just how the board feels about it. And it's based on how the board gives recommendations to the town council when the board serves in its advisory capacity. So that would be on commercial design review projects, and use permit projects, for anything that you don't have decision-making authority, such as um, which is single-family residential and signs. And tonight, we made motions and we approved the project subject to conditions. When we, in the past, our the advisory um, capacity has been that each member um, comments on the project, and those comments are then forwarded to council without a specific recommendation. The reason this is coming up is. Um, the Vineyard Oaks project was before you last month, and when I met the applicants out in the hall, they said, what, what is that, is that our approval? They, it was, um, it was different for them that it wasn't a more formal approval, um, and that could have been an approval for recommendations with suggestions that they work on certain items. And that would be easier, I believe, for the applicant to know how to shape the project before they take it to council they feel more um, secure with the recommendation um, because oftentimes um, comments can um, take many different forms and there are often comments that are repeated by more than one member but there's not always a consensus so that could be something that um, is a benefit both to the applicant but also to the council when they go on to review the project so um, I know for some of us we've discussed that um, this possibility before, but I wanted to open it up and to see and see how the board feels about it. The floor is ours. I endorse it. We tried it before. We weren't successful, but it's still a good idea. So I think you know we looked at two items tonight, and the last item is take a decision. We just need to, with your help, putting that at the bottom of a discussion, staff report push us to make a motion on a recommendation. Procedurally, it'll be a little different. There'll be a motion, there'll be a vote. Um, just the vote is merely a recommendation. Mm -hmm. If I could chime in, we talked about a little before the meeting, and part of it would be staff's responsibility to try to summarize the issues. So. There's a roadmap of what you're all trying to get consensus or vote on. And we, we have in the distant past, we used to like take a vote on all of these. How, how do you like the roof line? And everybody, you know, and take a vote. And it gets a little cumbersome. I agree with you uh, on that. And then there's items that are brought up unanticipated by staff, by the ZDRB members that uh, are new issues and uh, so we'd have to figure out how to add those to the list but if, if we're trying to go forward to the council with a, a concise you know real concise recommendation hitting on all the uh, important points and aspects of the project I it's hard to see any other way around it than, than to do it that way because what we end up with otherwise is a list of comments where your names are listed and then what you said is sort of next to it and some may overlap with others uh, on board members and may not and, and there's different shades of liking something uh, almost agreeing but not exactly and it gets it's hard to interpret if I were a council member with that meant. I agree I think it would be much more beneficial to the town council most of us are here because we have some sort of background design, planning, architecture, whatever, that I would think that the purpose of our being here is to provide them with decisions based on our knowledge to help them make their decisions. So a consensus or an answer or a vote would be more beneficial to them to than comments, I would think. I think there's always been a slightly bit, slight bit of ambiguity about ZDRB's role and the board's role. And actually, I think Jason was very good at understanding that. 
the differences, and I think even among small towns and communities, the relationship between ZDRB and the town council is a little unusual in that we're not really a planning commission or whatever. It's our ability to recommend, influence, provide counsel, and so on, is a little unclear to me. And um, I've always, you know, deferred to Jason and so on, and Rob when he was here and so on, about being able to ask good questions. But sometimes I'm not 100% sure on what we're trying to ascertain about a project. Do I like it personally? Does it seem to conform to written documents within the town management structure? You know, what is our role? And we've dealt with this numerous times in the three years that I've been here, mostly under Jason's excellent leadership, calling meetings and trying to forcefully outline our role. And I'm not 100% sure we got there, but, you know, we are concerned citizens who are interested in our properties and the future of the town, but I think we could do a lot more. I think the, the ZDRB could do a, could be the planning commission for the town. It's just not there in writing, and uh, so it's a little fuzzy about what we're supposed to be doing to me. I have a lot of opinions, and they're not always well received because I come from more of a commercial background and uh, I respect the input that you guys give us but still I don't think there's very there's been a lot of real direction on what ZDRB is up to as opposed to what we could be up to which I think is powerful we have a lot of smart people on this town a lot of people who really care about the properties and the properties are of other people like me and uh, you can't rewrite the city charter but I think a little more def definition of what the council wants from us we could deliver it in a heartbeat just tell us what you want us to do that's my opinion I don't have a lot to add to all that I, I feel I'm relatively new and you guys have a lot of history that, that, that I uh, the question that was running through my mind while you were talking is how are our recommendations being received by council? Are, are they contradicting what we're saying at the end of the day uh, in terms of giving someone approval on a project or not? Are we seeing that there's a lot of disparity between what we've said and the council members' feelings? That's, so that's a question to you guys. Not um, well, I think when you make comments on a project, mm -hmm. The presumption is that you feel it's worth approving, although that's never, all, well, that's not always said. And so it goes down to the comments. And comments um, are, on an individual level, are not addressed by the town council. They look at the project as an overall. So an overall recommendation of approval, um, maybe with suggestions that they pay attention to certain aspects, I think would be easier for them to accept and act on um, than what they're getting now. So, uh, it kind of seems like watching um, the last town council meeting, they just kind of started fresh mm -hmm. without a direction, not a forceful, but a clear indication of what the ZDRB thought of the project. They just started fresh with their own personal ideas and not, didn't have a foundation of what our advice was. Just watching them discuss it. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement on what we can do. I think the connection between what we're trying to do here, or at least what we think we're trying to do, and what we're trying to deliver to the next level up, it's, it's something that we don't know what they think about what we do, and we, we, we get no feedback, so we don't know if we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, or no thing, or... I mean, Part of that, I believe, is that even if we were to vote on everything, you know, identify six issues and really do a project and then do 
down the line vote, and then so we have how each member feels, and there will be a you know, an up or down kind of a thing. Uh, majority favors this or opposes the, that aspect. It's also, I think, important to weight them to where they don't all hit the council with equal importance. That if you feel strongly about one aspect over all others or a couple, that we note that to them that we feel uh, out of all of these, we, these are very important to us to pay attention to. Is the remedy to that, Bob, rather than having six up or down votes on a given application, to simply have one? I've voted for an application that there was a particular component of it that was objectionable to me, but I didn't feel so strongly that I would vote no for it. There have been cases where there was a particular element that was objectionable enough to cause me to want to torpedo the project, if you will. So maybe that's the remedy. We're going to make a motion. This is the set of recommendations, and there won't be a yes recommendation to approve unless three people can agree on the recommendations. And I think that would sort of winnow out that waiting issue. And the rationale, the thinking behind why it's a good or not so good, uh, why you support it or oppose it, gives them something to hang their hat on as far as uh, when they're evaluating it. It's not just the TRB doesn't, they voted this down, they don't like it. Uh, it's the thinking behind that. Right? You know, there's, there's the standards, zoning standards, and we take care of those when you talk about what do you do. And it's the setbacks, and we, you know, we go through all of those, and and then there's a design aspect of projects that we tend to stay away from, um, other than whether they're meeting some general guidelines about earth tone colors and you know that type of thing. There's some d designs that are converged on by plate heights and roof pitches that are encouraged and recommended in the design ordinance, and we kind of look at those. But then when it comes to your sense of how it's appropriate and fits into its setting, I think that's where you have rearranged and maybe the staff does. Um, and it becomes a judgment of design. And letting them know if you pose that, why, why you think it isn't appropriate for its setting or how it does work. I think they would listen to that. And I frequently also believe they are a little going into something, looking for some guidance as well. And I think that's if this is your key can provide to them. I hope so. They may Absolutely. be neutral on something and then sitting some of them and are open to persuasion. So when something comes before us and I'm new to this, like the product that we come in, house, if it was red, painted bright red, bright pink, it's not on our list of things to talk about, but we can say, we wish you would not paint it pink. Or is that within our parameters? Well, actually, the color, there is a section that um, favors muted colors that are appropriate with Old Town, so it should be within those general um, parameters. Um, but if it, was, if it yes. wasn't but in yes, one of those two. <laughs> Yeah, we have had the. I mean, can we go into any aspect of the design of the project if we felt there was a really strong problem with it? Yeah, even if it isn't within uh, the call back. But they, they kind of, with the, you know, uh, work on Old Town that's been done recently as far as some better definition of what are less favored, the Tuscany, you know, influence and. You get a little better idea what the palette is, a, a farmhouse and uh, craftsman, bungalow, those types of uh, projects that are hitting on all the points of so porches in front, pitch roofs, uh, roofs that are hitting the plate at the same proportions that we have in the ordinance. So, um, yeah, and if you saw a design that maybe met those but were not appropriate for their setting they, they met the strict letter of the law you can comment on that the thing about paint colors is you do have initial say on it but then subsequent to that they can paint their house um, as they I, wish. I will that continue goes. to say and i know the ship has sailed but i will continue to say it's absurd 
that we can approve or deny a color only for new or remodeled construction and have no say on its repaint. I would rather we have no say on the color. I live next to a lime green and fuchsia plus. So I, I feel particularly strongly about this. Poor Bob knows that. <laughs> I know you have. Now we now do. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, the children have to but uh, one exercise for you, or any of you, if you see a building in town that you don't like, and you could formulate what you would tell the, Z uh, the town council and a recommendation as to why you don't think it works or is appropriate, and pivot off of the design guidelines. Uh, maybe the design guidelines that need to be more specific and less vague, uh, more directed in nature. Then that creates another set of problems. I think we're basically here to support you. I mean, you guys do a whale of a job and do all the heavy lifting. And I think the, the disconnect for me is after we do our thing here and it's all great, what happens next? I mean, is there some disconnect on communication about some of our conversations or with, with the council as they're making decisions about projects or if we can not entirely focused is what it is yeah, it's our thank end. you our unfocused yeah. unfocused so it's kind of a an effort by a lot of people it's not getting the maximum impact so. downside and I, I, think and there, I don't know, you know what to say about that, but I can sense it. A joint meeting between the CDRB and the council, I think it would be endlessly frustrated if you are of a mindset that of what's acceptable and appropriate, and then they're of another where they're just rolling over that. Uh, if we can get together on what it ought to be and get some ground rules, that might help. If we completely turned down a design project that came to us, just for advisory. Would the architect go back and redesign it before it went to town council, or even though we turned it down, it would go to town council? I think it would definitely go to a redesign. They don't want to go to council with a recommendation of denial based on the issues that they raised. They would be but it's permitted to. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, they, they could take their chances and try that. But with a stronger recommendation, it will have a stronger impact on how they feel leaving this meeting. They feel sort of ambiguous. What happened with the recommendation? Which comment do I listen to? Because I know I got to change something. I'm just not sure what. <laughs> so. Question I have is what what format would you want something in? Is it like check boxes? Yes, no per per member up here, or is it? Before we come in here, we fill out a comment sheet and give it back to you. You know what I mean? Like, no, I think it's the way we'll want? form our staff report. And Jason mentioned how when it, um, in this, the staff reports before you tonight, it gives a recommendation action, re recommendation to take action on the project. So it would be a recommendation to um, recommend approval or denial, subject to these certain items that are important. And as to those items, we try to call out what we think is important. Um, but Bob mentioned you're not limited to that. If there's something that really stands out for you that we haven't mentioned, when it's open to discussion, that could come out as something that the, the board has a consensus on, and so that'll get passed along as well. So we'll help you through the process, um, and I say we start this with our next meeting in, um, in June, that whatever's on that agenda that's um, going to be advisory to council, we try to send it off with a recommendation either way. With a vote or a consensus statement. Or mm -hmm. Right, we'll guide that at the time. But the reason, uh, the other reason is you, you don't want to really fully form your opinion until you've heard all of the testimony and go through the entire area. I should have said it after the fact. I, yeah. didn't, I understand what you're saying. I didn't mean that in terms of timing when we do it. But. And Jason, with by far the most experience, do you see how this can work? Yes, we need, we need a, a shorter leash.
to do or won't do it. Do we make well, a motion here yeah. to... Yeah. Do I need to make a motion on that? To no. Include that in the next? <laughs> right, I'm just well, going to start making motions everywhere I go at this point. If we're recommending we do this, that's why. I should we? <laughs> <laughs> we should um, do it as practice, perhaps. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so that it becomes more of the mindset that right. motion will come out of just about every public hearing or presentation and discussion. Do I make it a motion to uh, adjourn? Then? So moved. Yeah. Little rough, but uh, it's interesting.